Yep. Thank you. So I'm Mikkel. Uh, I am a game director at Paradox Interactive, and I've been there for six years now. Started as a game designer uh, on the same project that we uh, now shipped last October, Victoria 3. Um, and first, a little bit about my career path and my um, favorite games and things like that, what I call my expertise. Uh, I didn't start out in the game industry. I started uh, out actually in computer sales uh, and moved into IT support and then software uh, project management. Uh, and then, due to my love of games, eventually ended up uh, back in Sweden after spending a long time in Canada uh, in Stockholm, where I'm currently with, uh, with Paradox. Uh, and I would say that if there's one sort of common thread uh, throughout all the things that I've done uh, is sort of identifying human problems and coming up with technical solutions to them. Uh, and this is, this is definitely very central to the talk that I'm going to have, um, have today. I really like games that are slow paced. Uh, so that's strategy games, turn based, or the ones that we do at Paradox. The, uh, real time with pause, right? So you can take your time or speed up as you like. Uh, puzzle games, management games, uh, things like that. Things with lots of intricate systems that connect. Again, a central theme that you're going to continue to see. Um, and I also have a background in analog games, uh, role playing games, tabletop uh, role playing games, board games, and live action uh, role playing games. And in particular, uh, again, I really like the uh, story games uh, kind of uh, uh, games that have a central set of mechanics that mediate the player experience and generate stories uh, as opposed to like pre-written stories that you're playing through. So again, you're going to be seeing a lot of uh, repetition in terms of those themes today. Um, so first, I want to talk a little bit about uh, how this relates to some big uh, sort of purist ideas about what games are, narratology and, uh, and ludology. Uh, how do you marry these two things together when you're talking about uh, management games, simulation games, uh, which have a very strong like player directive, but then also tying stories in with that? And the answer to that is I don't care. For <laughs> the next 40 minutes or so, we are going to not worry about any of this. And we're just going to assume that players have uh, a motive to either experience a story or do well in the game. And they also appreciate the other side of it. Uh, and for games where that is not true, those aren't the games I'm talking about today. So a uh, bit of a cop-out answer, but this is where we're at. I'm not here to present a grand unified theory of games. I'm here to talk about practical things that you can use in your game design work. Um, so I'm going to go through the following things today. Uh, what I mean by a clockwork story and, and why I'm not using a better term like procedural narrative. Uh, when and where they aren't useful, when you should not apply these principles at all. Um, some ingredients, practical examples, and challenges with making them. And uh, if we have time, I'm going to touch a little bit on the, about business cases around them because it's a pretty special beast as well. And if you're in this room, I hope that you are uh, a game designer or interested in game design uh, and you want to know some of the hows and whys of procedural narrative. We'll start with this. Uh, the nature of a clockwork story, this is a game, or a term, this is a term that I came up with. This is not an established term. So uh, what I mean for the purpose of this talk by this is uh, there's some central engine, some central component uh, of interlocking mechanics uh, that sits at the center of the game experience, and it mediates this uh, core loop that the player is engaging in. Uh, and it starts always with the player input. Uh, the player takes some action that they think will benefit them in the, in the case of the game. So this could be something like, I'm going to move my armies towards the enemy capital, or I am going to bribe the councilmen uh, to try to get my way, right? Uh, whatever it happens to be, they've analyzed the situation. They go, this is my optimal point of, point of action, uh, and they take that action. That gets fed into the simulation, uh, and it has some effect. 
the intended effect, hopefully, uh, the armies move closer to the capital, the councilman becomes more uh, pleased with them, uh, but it also might have a number of, uh, of additional knock-on effects. Uh, and this is where the simulation comes in and all the different agents that make up that simulation. Because of that, there's a number of knock-on effects that change the game state in ways that the player didn't expect but are still plausible and logical. Uh, and the player will observe those things and use their observation to take the next input, right? So it's a constant loop of action and surprise, and action and surprise. Uh, and you might think uh, this is just a core loop, right? This is just what a core loop looks like. So I'm going to go into a few counterexamples uh, and examples of what I actually mean by this in terms of actual games. Um, to illustrate why uh, this is a special thing and not just, you know, every game follows this pattern. So, Disco Elysium. Uh, how many people here have played Disco Elysium? Uh, great. If you have not, you should. Uh, it's great. It is not an example of a clockwork story. Uh, it is, however, uh, an example of a role-playing game that makes you feel like you're in a dynamic emergent uh, uh, world. Uh, where your actions matter. But the way that it creates this is not with a simulation engine in the center, but rather with very traditional uh, branching storytelling techniques. They just have a lot of them. Another thing that they do uh, really well here to make it seem like the world is really responding to you um, is instead of designing a bunch of intricate puzzles that you have to uh, go through the gates of in order to progress a story, uh, they just give you a number of human decisions that you have to make. You always know that you have these decisions you have to make, and you make those decisions, and it keeps going. Uh, but it is still just narrative gates that lead to other narrative gates. Mass Effect and Bioware RPG kind of things. And here we have a simulation. Uh, we have a simulation of a combat system in particular, but the combat system doesn't feed into the story. It's just yet another gate to the story. Right. So you have to succeed in these uh, things that form the core loop in order to uh, progress. Right? And sure, there's branching narratives, uh, and there's all kinds of twists and turns, and that's great, but they're still, again, uh, handcrafted, uh, and, and there's no, no mediation by an engine. <clears throat> Moving forward, uh, Factorio, which is one of my, one of my favorites, uh, is uh, definitely a, a clockwork kind of game. There's definitely an engine here, uh, but it's, uh, it is a management game. And uh, while it has this really intricate engine that exhibits a lot of the properties that I've talked about with uh, cause and effect and, and uh, unexpected outcomes, uh, there's no real narrative to, to this. You crash on a planet, you have to build a factory to build a spaceship to get off the planet. Uh, so if they added a bunch of story elements, maybe this could qualify as a clockwork story, but as it stands, it does not. Uh, another counterexample going even further, uh, Falling Sand or Powder Toy. Uh, I bring this up because they uh, use an element uh, that's very common in clockwork stories called cellular automata, uh, very simple uh, individual atomic elements that contain properties that interact in predictable ways that give you a sort of flow uh, that feels very organic through the simulation. Uh, but again, there's no story here. There's not even a player goal. It's just a sandbox, a toy, right? Uh, but you can think about this uh, and these examples and how they do apply uh, as, we, as we go through here. Some actual good examples. Uh, these are from my company. These are two of uh, our most uh, successful games, Crusader Kings 3 and Stellaris. Both of them are about um, empire building. Uh, the player is trying to build huge empires that stand the test of time over centuries. Um, but the stories that they tell are very different because of the mechanics that they employ. In Crusader Kings, uh, you're playing a character uh, that is one of the members of a dynasty. And when that character dies, you will play that character's heir. And they will inherit their... Um, their, their feudal uh, titles and things like that. Uh, and you have to do a lot of sort of family planning and dynasty planning and relationship building 
Uh, and the implication here is that history is created uh, through these great men with great ideas, and they're the ones holding the, the kingdom together. Uh, and if they have a feud with a bishop that poisons their wine, they could die and the entire empire falls apart. And so it teaches the player that these relationship, uh, relationships are very important to the story. Uh, in Stellaris, Stellaris is a space opera, like uh, Star Wars or, or Star Trek, right? And it also spans centuries, uh, and it starts when these, this alien species that you, uh, that you portray, uh, they find a way off their home world, so they start their first forays into the galaxy, uh, and, uh, and it ends several hundred years later with huge intergalactic wars and alien incursions from alternate dimensions, and everything gets very, very massive. Um, and the story elements are very, very different to Crusader Kings. You're not playing a character, you're playing an entire civilization. Uh, and, uh, and it creates a very different kind of story. And now, somehow, I have managed to push a button. That, there we go. Um, another genre that still exhibits a lot of these, uh, these facets are colony simulators and colony management games. Dwarf Fortress and RimWorld are two of the most famous ones uh, and uh, really great examples of this. Uh, you are playing a, uh, an invisible force that wants the best you can for this colony and you're planning out where things should be but you're not actually constructing it. You have little AI agents that run around, your colonists that run around and, uh, and build this for you and manage the colony uh, and make sure that everything's good, but they have their own wills, right? They have their own needs and their own stuff that they want to do. Uh, and so they're not going to just starve themselves uh, to build the stable because you want them to build a stable. They will run off and find some food and they will run off and find some companionship and things like that. Uh, and these stories are a lot smaller, um, more personal. Uh, you see these uh, agents as individuals, and you often become very emotionally attached to them, even though they're just like little containers of bits with very low fidelity graphical uh, representation. Um, to illustrate that you don't need to have like Dwarf Fortress 20 years to build uh, this amazing uh, intricate simulation or uh, or like Paradox, a big team and budget to, uh, to make one of these games. Here's one of my current obsessions, uh, Shadows of Forbidden Gods, which is a one-man indie project of, uh, an, uh, where you play an evil god that's about to awaken uh, and bring about apocalypse. And your job is to influence agents across this um, procedurally generated map to uh, spread your evil corruption and influence around the world uh, to, to bring about, to sort of uh, make the world, make the world, um... <laughs> yeah. uh, no. I need to stop clicking. Uh, to make the world uh, prepared for your arrival. Right. And the differences between the different gods that you play uh, are very important here. They generate, again, very different stories. If you are uh, playing a, like this guy, a giant evil worm that will come uh, and eventually um, arrive onto Earth and uh, destroy level cities and destroy armies, or if you're playing like a god of insanity that will slowly drive the world insane, you might e not even arrive before the world is destroyed. And uh, they, it accomplishes this by just changing up some uh, of the powers that you have in your employ. Uh, some uh, action RPGs. Weirdly, perhaps, you might think, uh, how, can, how can these qualify? Uh, but uh, I, I would argue that they do. Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord uh, is an action RPG. You're playing a character. But as you're becoming more and more powerful, you get the actual influence to affect uh, the world in very tangible ways. You will conquer fortresses and control trade uh, and things like this and change the power balance uh, in a very systemic way that will create a different kind of story. 
Uh, this one we're going to return to, Shadow of Mordor. It is definitely not sort of a prototypical uh, clockwork story, but it has a subsystem called the Nemesis system, which I think fits extremely well into this. So why would you want to do this? Uh, why would you want to embark on making one of these things? Uh, you will want to do it if you want to create a game that can tell many types of stories in an endless fashion. Uh, if you want to make something that your players can play forever uh, and enjoy forever, uh, this, is, this is one way to do it if you don't want to make a MOBA. Um, and uh, also if you want to give your players the sense that they're the owners of the story. They get to interpret uh, what this means and they get to, to control it. Uh, they're prompted by the game, sure, uh, but, but they are ultimately the ones that are deciding what does this story mean to them. They're also great at giving you, uh, at giving you stories about systems and societies in a way that you often don't get in sort of plot-oriented, narrative-oriented character or character-driven kind of, kind of narratives. Um, a great example for this is if you know the TV series of Wire, uh, there's a lot of characters in there, but it's not really about them, it's about the systems that they are part of. Uh, and these games can do very much the same thing. Uh, and they're also extensible to telling new stories. You can use these um, systems to, like I mentioned with the Shadow of Forbidden Gods, uh, create some additional add-on uh, content that will suddenly change the entire nature of the, of the story that you're telling. What you want to stay away from, though, is if you have a very clearly defined, this is exactly what I want to do, uh, you should absolutely not employ any of these principles. It's a waste of your time and money. Um, and uh, if you also have, if you also want to, is related to that, but if you want to tell a story that's going to be consumed in a very specific uh, chunk, like if you want, this is a 30 minute story or this is a three hour story, these aren't going to be good for that uh, because you, you aren't in, in control of pacing to the same degree. Uh, <laughs> you will be open to interpretation. Uh, I will return to this when I get to the balance section, uh, but if you're not careful, your story will be misinterpreted, and sometimes you're fine with that, and sometimes that can be very, very bad for you. Uh, so if you're not prepared to put in the work to avoid misinterpretation, uh, this is something you want to be uh, careful with. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's the same points again. I'm going to keep moving, and we'll get, get to why that matters. So let's start with the central thing, the first step you want to do. You've decided you want to do something like this. Um, first, you need a theory of how the world works. Uh, and this is like I mentioned with Crusader Kings, for example. Uh, the theory behind that is that uh, history is made by these grander than life characters and the dynasties that they're a part of and the relationships that they have with other dynasties. And, uh, the things that matters are things like characters, dynasties, claims, and fiefdoms, right? Uh, that's, that's the important thing. If we were to tack on a, like a, a major mechanic onto that where you also had to track the food supply in every province of your territory to make sure that the people didn't rise up and depose you or something like that, and then we have something more of a management game or a nation building game. It's not really an interpersonal drama, a blood feud kind of, kind of game anymore. RimWorld, uh, this is uh, very much a survival a management uh, kind of game. And it's important that you are constantly teetering on the edge of being able to live through another winter. Uh, because my analysis, at least, of RimWorld is that it's a, it's a tale of flexible morality. What do you do to survive? Uh, when one of your colonists starts going crazy because they've just been cooped up for three days because there's nuclear fallout outside uh, and they can't leave uh, and they go into a murderous rage, do you shoot them to save the rest of the colony? Or do you not do that, right? And it get, can get very brutal. Uh, and uh, and uh, that, in one way, makes it 
so much more rewarding when you're able to actually live out your humanity through these characters instead, when they have you know, two characters fall in love and have a little marriage ceremony or something like that in the colony. That, that becomes a counterpoint to, uh, to all the brutality, uh, pr brutality that this um, game provides you with. In Victoria 3, we've purposely, purposely taken the lens of historical materialism to see the world through. Uh, that historical progression is through social classes that uh, relate through, through their relationships with production. And uh, that means that we get to use uh, management kind of gameplay to drive a story about uh, revolutions and political upheaval. Uh, so the things that matter to Victoria is um, things like what what class are you? What are the laws in this country? Uh, what sort of material goods do you have access to and do you not have access to? Uh, so this is where things like tracking the food supply in Crusader Kings that wouldn't work for that game works terrifically well in Victoria uh, because that's exactly what it's about. How does the world evolve depending on uh, these uh, material forces? So a very related thing, once you've established this and you've made sure that you stick to this principle uh, as, you, as you continue along development, uh, you have to also make sure that you have a vocabulary for your game. Um, and that vocabulary needs to, be, uh, needs to be coherent around the theme uh, that you're looking for and able to tell the kinds of stories that you want to tell. You can be arbitrary with choosing these terms. It's very common that we will... Um, that we will go, hey, we need this mechanic that should sort of work like this. And then we go, hmm, what should we call it? Okay, well, what's the thematic word for that? It needs to fit with the rest of the stuff because that's what players will relate to. Um, an example from, uh, uh, from uh, Dwarf Fortress. Dwarf Fortress, I think, is uh, the, the AI agents, the dwarfs that build your colony are very peculiar little beasts. Uh, they... they uh, uh, they are, uh, they, they don't think like us, right? The things that matter to them are things like myths and plump mushrooms and digging, right? Like these are not human kind of terms. These are not the things that we care about when we think about a management game. We might think about things like roads and siege engine and inflation and whatever, and that doesn't matter to dwarves. What matters to dwarves is whether they're, you know, their, their ancient king has the right kind of granite uh, in their throne room, right? Like, that's the stuff that matters. So uh, you want to make sure, again, that your vocabulary reflects this because this is the language that the teller, player's going to tell, uh, retell these stories to themselves in. Uh, AI agents are something that I think that... I have not been able to identify any game that I would call a clockwork story game that does not employ AI agents in some way. Uh, and the reason for this is, uh, or one reason for this, is because you need some element of chaos and randomness in your game in order to make it dynamic and replayable. Uh, and players hate random. I don't know if you've noticed this, but players hate random stuff uh, because it feels unfair when it doesn't work for you uh, it, it feels like the game is punishing you. And when it does work for you, you feel like, ah, that was just a gimme. I didn't work for that. Um, but AI agents, people with personality, um, they do act in sort of random fashion. You can insert this random vector through these characters um, because players don't expect uh, people to be behaving in perfectly predictable ways. And when people engage with other people, and then so on, it becomes this sort of butterfly effect that reverberates through the simulation uh, and lets you insert this randomness and dynamism into the game in a way that you can't if you're just working with mechanistic kind of elements. Uh, so as an example of, of uh, how this might work in a game like um, Shadow of Forbidden Gods, uh, here, like I mentioned, you are a god who's slumbering. You have no direct influence on the world, but you're acting through your agents. Uh, and in this example, you have two agents, a dissident, which is a rebel-rousing uh, uh, elf, and you have a courtier uh, who is a nobleman in a city. 
And your ultimate goal here, uh, as part of this action that you're taking, is to infiltrate uh, the city and, and, and gain some power over it. Uh, and the way that you do this is with your dissident agent, you raid a village in the outskirts because that reduces the food supply of the village, which reduces the food availability in the city that it's connected to, which increases the unrest in the city, which reduces the security, which means that your courtier has an easier time infiltrating the city to, for example, uh, start a cult of the deep ones or whatever it is that they do. As a result, though, uh, and this could be a totally random role. Uh, the ruler of the city becomes aware and orders a nearby hero to uh, get rid of this evil influence. And the, the hero goes, okay, well, who has the highest menace? Oh, it's this nearby dissident guy. And so the player has taken these actions and as a perfectly normal consequence, but not predictable consequence, this nearby hero is starting to... Um, to chase the dissident around the map, and you have to make some decisions around, do you want to sacrifice him, or do you want to, uh, or do you want to try to, to protect him? Uh, pretty simple example, but it's, it's, uh, it feels very natural, and it's not predictable. You can't assume that that's exactly what's going to happen when you take the action. A more nuanced example, this is from Crusader Kings 3. You're playing the king and you decide you want to throw a feast. Maybe you just want to do something nice for your, uh, for your subjects, or maybe you want to uh, actually, um, you, you have some sort of other plan. You have some sort of intrigue uh, that, you want to, that you want to cause at this feast. But you throw a feast, um, and one of your feudal subjects, a duke, uh, decides to attend, uh, also random. He decides to attend, he starts traveling to the feast, but a random event means that he's waylaid by bandits and killed. His heir isn't old enough yet to become the new duke, so there's a cousin of his that becomes a regent. The cousin has never before become a relevant character. He's completely powerless, but it turns out that your uh, father insulted his father at some other feast a generation ago, and so in the back of his mind, in the back of the simulation, he's been angry with your di dynasty the whole time. Now he has power and decides, random role, that he is going to start plotting your son's demise. Uh, the player has absolutely no idea <laughs> what might happen if he throws a feast, but you're able to trace all of this back and go, this is totally plausible. All of these events could have happened, and it's because I did this thing. So that's why AI agents are super important for this. Another thing, though, is that um, simulations are built up of uh, numbers and data, and they're not very suitable for storytelling uh, as such. Uh, so we need some sort of interface to the player. Uh, and one uh, common pattern that we use for this uh, is something we call storylets. Uh, and uh, this is a fairly widely accepted term, I think. Um, it's not just used at Paradox, but generally. So I'm going to be going through three different examples of what I feel our storylets are. Um, the common things around them are that they need some sort of trigger. Uh, they might have some sort of effect on the game state, and they have some sort of content. So in this case, we have a game called Cultist Simulator, uh, the company behind this uh, weather factory, um, and previously, I forget the name now, but the people who make Fall in London, um, they're experts at implementing the storylet concept. So I highly recommend you check this out. Uh, Cultist Simulator runs entirely on, on storylets, so basically every action you take, you get one of these things, and then you take another action and so on. Uh, and in this case, what has happened is that you have a card called the Ignisius Club, you have dropped that on an Explore card, and you've added a coin card for the entrance, and uh, randomness happens, and one of these events pop up. Uh, and this is like what happens to you uh, at the Ignisius Club tonight. And that's a deck of cards that could be, you know, could contain 10, 15 uh, different things that might happen, uh, but they're all plausible things. The important thing here is that 
uh, the way that they write their storylets is extremely abstract uh, and, and it's almost poetry, right? Uh, so you have this little snippet of narrative and it's proper, like good writing, um, but it's generated randomly through playing the game and you can piece these together in almost any sequence and still make a coherent story out of it by filling in the blanks uh, in between. At, uh, in Victoria 3, we're a lot more concrete with our storylets and a lot more sparing. So we usually use these to um, illustrate uh, like important historical uh, points, uh, not necessarily like this is the thing that happened on this year uh, in history, but rather uh, this is a kind of event that could have happened, right? So we're a lot more concrete. We have uh, like animated uh, intro, images and a historical quote that's often like told by a real character, an audio stinger that sets, sets the mood and things like that. So in this particular case, uh, there's an election in your country and the uh, free trade party has decided to campaign in this election. And as one of the many events that can happen out of this, uh, you get this event and you get a choice whether you want to favor the free trade party or the democratic incumbents. Um, and that's it. And this is like a moment that's identifiable as a story moment uh, while you're continuing to play this sort of management kind of strategy game. This is uh, probably my, my most controversial example of a story that. Uh, so this is from Shadows of Mordor, uh, and this is uh, part of the uh, Nemesis system, which is a, like a secondary system that you're engaging with while playing through the main plot line. Uh, and the way the nemesis system works is uh, you have a, a set of orcs that are like underbosses and lieutenants in every region. Uh, and whenever you get killed by an orc, uh, like one of the lowly grunts, they're elevated into uh, this reporting structure uh, and they're given a personality attribute. Uh, and a bunch of special powers, and they become like a real boy, right? Um, and you can see how they relate to everyone else in the reporting structure. Who do they report to? Are they mortal enemies with one of the other orcs and things like that? And they become important characters, uh, but in a completely dynamic fashion. Nothing is pre-scripted here. Um, and they spent a ton of time making dynamic cutscenes for all of these. So when you run into this orc, again, that killed you, uh, because you, you're resurrected, it's a whole thing. Uh, when you run into them again, the in-game engine will like set you up in this dramatic face-off with this orc that will act in a very exaggerated way, so you know this is exactly the guy, right? And you get to, um, to continue to have like a relationship with this orc throughout, throughout the game, or until you kill him. Uh, if, and then you have a boss fight, right, with, with this guy. And if you win, you get a cool reward, and if you lose, then he becomes even more powerful. And I've extended the system to sort of like, you can play favorites between, oh, I prefer that guy over that guy, or I wanna corrupt this guy and use him as an inside agent and things like that. And this is a pretty optional system. You don't have to engage with it, but it changes the storyline because you're playing through like the, the same sort of main plot, but there's all these cool things that happen as you're relating to these orcs uh, going through it. So this is, uh, I feel like these cutscenes are definitely storylets that, that can be recombined to, uh, to let you play, uh, to uh, experience a more, or tell a more coherent story over time. Um, here's some other lessons that uh, we've learned uh, in, in trying to employ this in simulation games and management titles in particular, um, is how we take these numbers uh, that this engine spits out and actually contextualize them into something that uh, can be construed and interpreted as a story. So uh, the first and most obvious thing that you sh could and should do is translate numbers into words. Uh, so in Victoria, we have, instead of saying that um, 
Uh, this particular uh, population group has a standard of living of 62. We say they have an opulent standard of living. Instead of saying your relationship with Prussia is minus 37, we say you have cold relations with Prussia, right? Um, so just make sure that you apply words that the player can use to retell the story uh, instead of make everything numbers. Another thing that you can do is uh, take numbers and track them in charts over time so that you can look at uh, the progression of a variable, like for example, standard of living. Uh, another example from Victoria is things like literacy and, and um, um, GDP and things like that. Uh, and you can, you can see where the ups and downs were over time. Um, RimWorld does this extremely well. Uh, with a chart that tracks the compound wealth of your colony. So it translates every single item that is in your colony into a monetary value and tracks that over time. So you can see how successful you are. But then they also uh, insert uh, little uh, inflection points on this or like little uh, pins on this chart for whenever major events happen, uh, like you're being raided or there was a nuclear winter uh, so that you can see not only did the, the wealth chart fall and dip during this time, but you can infer why. They don't, when they're building this chart, they don't know that that's why. And indeed, it might not even be the reason why. But by combining these things into one visual, uh, it lets you tell your own story and come up with your own explanation for why this happened. Uh, aggregating the data is super important. Uh, you, uh, you heard me talk before about cellular automata. In, uh, in um, Victoria, the way that we do this uh, is we, we basically track the economic uh, and political habits of the entire population of the world. So like a billion people at game start and two billion at the end. And the way we do this is by splitting them up into uh, groups of enti or entities we call uh, POPs, so parts of population. Um, and we still have, even though we split them up, we have between, say, 20,000 and 100,000 of these objects at any given time. And that's what the simulation runs on. It's completely unreasonable to assume that a player is going to be able to go through all these and keep track of them uh, and figure out what is happening by looking at the numbers on these, on these pops. So we have to aggregate this data. So that means, for example, that uh, standard of living value to determine how well your country is doing just you know, on a social level uh, and economic level, um, we uh, will give you that as an uh, aggregate value, like an averaged value. Um, but because the game's really about class conflict as well, that's actually very misleading. So a player will often look at this number and go, oh, okay, well, things are going better in my country. Why do I have so many radicals? And then we've aggregated it on the levels of lower class, middle class, and upper class as well. And then they go and dig further into that data and they go, oh, it's because the rich got much wealthier, but the poor were like absolutely exploited. And of course, that's where my radicalism is coming from. Uh, so it's important that you aggregate things on the correct levels and on different levels to tell the kind of story you want. Uh, another very, very useful way of aggregating data is uh, graphically using uh, map modes. If you have a map in your game that you can visualize things uh, either concretely on like a geographic map or uh, relationship maps, which I think is one of the most underused uh, things that you can do in a video game. Uh, the uh, Actually, Shadow of Mordor does it really well. You can see the reporting structure of the orcs, and you can see who's friends with who and, and who's not. Um, and also, uh, I think another good example is from Crusader Kings, where you can see every character's family tree and uh, switch view into seeing every character's feudal obligations, where they stand in that structure. Uh, consider if your game can use a relationship map uh, to illustrate these things. Uh, balancing, I mentioned at the top, is uh, extremely uh, crucial activity that you have to leave time for. 
when you build these things. The more intricate your simulations, the more time you need to build in for balancing. Uh, there's a couple of problems that can occur if you don't. Uh, your game can become incomprehensible. It's just nonsense stories. Uh, or you might be telling this kind of story that you don't want to be telling uh, inadvertently. So uh, these are all examples from Victoria. Uh, we have a system where interest groups, different uh, political entities can band together into different democratic parties. Uh, and they do so in a dynamic way by uh, basically calculating a weight score depending on the game, game state. So uh, if I have a radical interest group leader right now, it's more likely that I'm gonna be joining a party uh, that's more radical uh, and, and less likely that I'm going to be joining a more moderate party. Um, due to bad balancing on launch, we have this tendency for uh, some situations to occur uh, where groups would band together into these huge big tent parties where you had like social democrats and industrialists and communists and fascists all working together under one big banner against the <laughs> clergy. And uh, if there's anyone who you know, is familiar with 20th century history here, uh, you might go, that's not actually that unreasonable, but uh, the players didn't like that. That didn't seem reasonable to them. Uh, so you have to keep that in mind as well, especially when you're working with historical games. Uh, so we had to tweak that quite a bit. Another thing was uh, migration. We have mass migration waves that can happen uh, as, uh, in response to things like standard of living and calamities, calamities and war and things like that. Um, and um, that's all well and good, and that's something to be expected. You get huge migration waves, for example, from um, poorer parts of Europe to the Americas because there's lots of land there. Uh, it's all systemic driven. Uh, we didn't put a lot of checks and balances uh, onto the migration system, uh, which meant that you would suddenly have things like, um, well, Poland has no people in it anymore. And that doesn't make sense, right? Like you have to make sure that that sort of thing makes sense. Um, transitioning over into things that you might be unintentionally saying uh, because of bad balancing and standard of living migration kind of effects, you would also have things like um, an entire native population of say 100,000 people are now swamped by poor unemployed people from another country uh, and displaced and now that country that was successful before is now ruined because of the immigrants. This was not the story we wanted to tell. Uh, so uh, we had to put balances in place uh, there also to make sure that we weren't you know, repeating literal conspiracy theories. Uh, and um, related to that also an unintentional story because we had so much population growth uh, at certain points in the game um, that countries would literally run out of resources and opportunities for uh, constructing more industry for them. So to deal with that problem, uh, they would start pointless wars just to kill off a bunch of their people. Uh, we, wanted pe we wanted players to see their population as the resources uh, that, that they could use, not as problems that they needed to get rid of. Uh, so this is another, another thing due to you know, systemic issues and, and balancing work that we had to do. Um, and one of my uh, favorites or least favorites as it were, um, colonies pay no taxes, which is great for the people who run the colonies because it really makes it apparent how much they're becoming rich off of these colonies uh, and exploiting their subjects. But we also had another mechanic where very successful industries were very profitable would over time have a chance of uh, just increasing the wages a little bit. And because of these wage increases over time adding up uh, and the lack of taxes being collected, we had these like African colonies that were standing out as the highest standard of living in the world for everyone who lived there. And the message was taxes are bad. Uh, and again, not the message we wanted to send. So you gotta make sure you build in lots of room for balancing, especially if you're commenting on the real world, right? Um, I'm gonna try to get, go through this in one minute. Uh, so business models uh, for these games. 
if you have a game that um, a player can play forever and generate infinite number of stories and they only buy it once, that's not a very sustainable business model for you, you might think. Uh, there's actually a number of ways to get around this uh, and you have to be familiar with those and design your game accordingly. Uh, we use expansions at Paradox, so we just continually in evolve the game. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, we just continually evolve the game uh, with both free updates and paid updates uh, that, uh, that add more nuance, add more, uh, more mechanics, and uh, just shoot libraries of storylets, things like this. That's one way of doing it. Um, patronage, this is something that uh, Tarn and Zach Adams for uh, uh, Bay 12, the Dwarf Fortress guys, they did this for 20 years, I think. They were just like, hey, if you like our work, throw us some PayPal money. And that's how they survived until they just finally launched it on Steam last year and made uh, ridiculous gobs of cash. Uh, so this is something you can do, especially if you're running like an indie, uh, indie studio. Um, subscription, basically patronage, uh, uh, but mandatory. Uh, that's something you can use also. Uh, and I mean, you can still use something like Patreon for this. Uh, streaming, I think, is probably gonna happen in the future. The great thing about these games if you get players that are sort of hooked on playing them for a long time, uh, that's a bad way for, a bad thing for some business model, but a great way for uh, like Netflix style or Game Pass style uh, game streaming, uh, because that's exactly what they want, is, is games that keep people hooked and, and let them play longer and can play for an infinite amount of time. Uh, sustainability of these uh, business models really increase over time after you've, after you've dropped the, fur, the sort of base game and you've released a few, uh, a few update, updates, then uh, because of the sort of butterfly effects of what your game can do, uh, you will be able to spend uh, sort of less and less uh, time and resources uh, giving your game the ability to tell more things over time. Uh, which I also want to want to mention if you're the kind of person that likes to experiment with stuff for an extended period of time and you don't want to ever be done with the thing you do <laughs> but continue to perfect it uh, this is this is also a great thing for you to uh, to try out and uh, finally I want to mention uh, a very defined or unique thing I think about these games is because you can play them for so long uh, and not really get bored. It has this nostalgic element because you're used to the kind of story and, and, uh, uh, and you know the mechanics inside and out, but it's constantly surprising you as well. And that's a really cool aspect of these games uh, that I call your favorite surprise. That's my presentation. And uh, no time for questions, but uh, feel free to take down my uh, info and uh, hit me up after the show or at the after party tonight. I'm very happy to talk about this at length, as you've noticed. Thank you so much. <laughs>